Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center, Saved and Accepted, with Frank Gonzalez. Well, we're just happy to have you here and uh, happy to have you join us by television because this is an exceptionally fine series. Pastor Frank Gonzalez, who is the senior pastor of the Avon Park 7th Avenue Church, who is also the former speaker, director for 17 years of the Voice of Hope, uh, which is Lavoe's uh, and the, the Latino Voice of Prophecy is our speaker and how God has been blessing us through his ministry. He's been covering the seven words of hope. These are the seven sayings that took place from the cross when Christ was being crucified or the seven thoughts and ideas that came forward. And this afternoon, he is covering two more. This morning at the 11 o'clock hour, he did Delivered and Fulfilled. And today, again, two sermons, Saved and Accepted. In between those two sermons, uh, Tina and Michael Berry are going to do for us, Tina will be singing, Michael playing, The Blood Will Never Lose Its Power. We want to give all the time we can possibly give to Pastor Frank Gonzalez, and so Pastor Frank, the time is yours. Thank you, thank you. Welcome. Thank you for coming. And thank you for tuning in. Heavenly Father, may the meditation of your servant's heart and the words of his mouth be acceptable unto you and of help to somebody. And we'll give you the honor and the glory and the praise. And we'll do it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. amen and amen. We have been looking at the cross of Christ. It's a good thing to look at the cross of Christ. There's life in that look. Do you know that the Bible is the only book that I know that tells you that there's life in a look? The Bible invites us to look. Sometimes, dear, that's all you have the energy to do. Life has beat you down, and uh, your energy's gone, and all you can do is see. If you can see, and if you can listen, there's hope for you today, because this is coming to you, not from this pulpit, but from the universe's tallest pulpit, the cross of Christ, which is lifted up high so that we can see it clearly and so that we can get the life and the spirit and the power that is only there, only there. And we have been looking in a special way at these seven short sermons that Christ preached from his cross. Have you been blessed? Those of you who have come, I know I have. We've come to the sixth of these words. Now, you know, it's a common idea that when Christ died, he saved the church or the good people in the church. It surprises us to learn that he accomplished far more. He literally saved the world itself. Realizing what this means lifts our hearts as nothing else can do. This marvelous feat that Christ accomplished on his cross has been overlooked for many centuries. Now the time has come that the whole world learned what has been dimly understood for so long, why Jesus cried out with almost his last breath in a voice that shook heaven and earth, it is finished. John 19, verse 30. 
You know, even the physical energy required for a dying man to shout indicates, and maybe an angel strengthened him to uh, make that utterance. Now, let me ask you this question. What was it that he finished? He said, it is finished. What did he finish? Did he mean that now his sufferings were over and he could rest? That he paid the debt we owe? Yes. That and far, far more. Jesus told the people in John 12, verse 47, that the Father sent him down here with a specific assignment, a uh, job description, if you will. He was sent on a special mission. And we read in chapter 17 of John, verse 4, that the night before he died, in his prayer to his father, he claimed that he had done it. He said, quote, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. What did he say? That he finished it. This, this cry, it is finished, is the sixth of the seven words of hope that we have been looking at. Now, this is good news. The Bible says that this news one day is going to enlighten the globe with the glory of God. Now, let's look at what this means. You know, it wasn't the disciples and it wasn't church people that understood this first. You know who it was? The Samaritans. The Samaritans understood the truth more quickly than the Jews. In fact, more quickly than the 12 apostles. After only one meeting with Jesus, they said of him in John chapter 4, verse 42, this is indeed the Savior of the world. Now, Paul said something interesting in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. And this is going to start helping us. This is sort of a, oh, someone would say a hermeneutic key. It just means something will help you understand. <laughs> to unlock what does it mean? that Jesus is the Savior of the world. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it says that He is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Did you get that? So, Jesus is the Savior of all men, but especially of those that believe. So, if he is said to be especially the Savior of those that believe, there must be a sense, some sense, in which he is also the Savior of people who do not believe in him. Do you get that? He is the Savior of the world, especially of those that believe. This is actually very simple and clear. There are two ways in which the word Savior is understood. He saved us all now in our present physical life. And for those who believe, He also saves them unto eternal life. You see, this is a truth that is not often shared. But this world would not be around already if it were not for the Savior of the world. That cross has preserved the physical world, this world, and you know it's in bad shape and getting worse. <laughs> but it wouldn't be around if it were not for the cross of Christ where the Savior of the world died. That's a, that's a new take on uh, ecology. <laughs> Christ ecology. <laughs> 
You see, our very physical life was purchased for us by the sacrifice of the Son of God. One wise writer, she says that every meal that we eat is in reality a sacrament. That the cross of Christ, she says, is stamped on every loaf of bread. Most people do not realize this, for they have never been told. That means that they eat unworthily, not discerning the Lord's body. She's quoting uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, John 6, 48. The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. See that? He gave life to the world itself. Oh, if people go their merry way and they don't realize. They say, well, you know, Jesus is for you guys. Jesus is for you religious people. Jesus is for the church people. Uh, he's done nothing for me. Excuse me. Excuse me. The very life you have. Listen, stop a moment, dear, and take a deep breath. Let's all take a deep breath. Now, you should give thanks to Jesus for that breath. <laughs> because whether you deserved it or not, and in fact you didn't, and I didn't, it is a gift that Christ has given you and me as the Savior of the world. But this isn't often communicated. The world itself would have perished Life on this planet would have ceased if the Son of God had not given Himself for us. All of this is included in the truth of the cross of Christ. See that? We should be more grateful. And there is still a larger sense in which Christ accomplished a mighty feat on the cross. You know one of the things He did? He conquered Satan. Praise God. The enemy of God. Do you know that Satan was at one point the most beautiful of all the holy angels? But he came up with a new invention. All by his lonesome self. You know what the invention is? Sin, yes. And when he refused to repent, by the way, he had chances to repent. When he refused to repent again and again and again, he lost his character as Lucifer, meaning the one who bears light, the light bearer. And he rebelled. And he decided he was going to defeat God in this cosmic war of the ages and take over the throne of God for himself. God help us. This is known as the great controversy between Christ and Satan. The war is fought in human hearts worldwide. It's a war of either believing the truth of God or believing Satan's lie. And the cross is the means of Satan's defeat. <laughs> Whether in the great cosmic controversy, or in the battle with sin in yours and mine single human heart. The key is the cross of Christ. The controversy began in heaven. We read it in Revelation 12. You know, some people are fixated on heaven. The only thing they care about is to go to heaven. Now, it's not a bad uh, pursuit. <laughs> We all want to go to heaven. But the safety, the hiding place for the soul is not heaven as such. It is in heaven, but it's not heaven as such because this began in heaven. The problem began in heaven. Our safety is not heaven. Our safety is Jesus Christ. 
We read in Revelation 12, there was a war in heaven. In heaven? Yeah, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. The old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verses 7 and 9. You know, Michael is, is uh, one of the many names of Christ. It means one who is like God. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, believed the lie Satan and, uh, had said, and, and they welcomed him into their world and our world. And now Satan's big argument is that he's invented something so powerful, so strong, that not even God can defeat it. See? And that something that Satan claims is invincible is sin in our sinful fallen flesh. He says, good luck. And it has seemed as though he's right. It has seemed as though Satan would win the great controversy because sin has taken root in our sinful nature so deeply that the world is full of it. Everybody has been a slave of sin. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned, and there is none righteous, no, not one. One with a lower case. But there is one with a capital case <laughs> who did in our common humanity. He took on our common humanity. He took on our, our dysfunctional humanity. And in his own life, he defeated Christ in the flesh. According to Hebrews 4.15, it says that Jesus was, quote, in all points tempted like as we are. And there we pause, the breathless. And what happened? <laughs> he, he, he was tempted in all points. What was the outcome? The inspired words go on, yet without sin. Amen. Praise God. For him, the temptation to give in to Satan and go ahead and sin was so terribly strong, people, that he sweated drops of blood. We haven't done that yet. It took every milligram of his soul energy to say no to Satan's most alluring temptations. But I got news for you. Ooh. If it weren't that you are a little dizzy with what you ate, I'd have you get up and shout. <laughs> Jesus said that he emerged victorious. The Bible says that he, quote, unquote, condemned sin in the flesh. <laughs> Thus he gained the glorious victory. And all who appreciate what he accomplished will pray David's prayer, create in me a clean heart, O God. Psalm 51.10. Now the Son of God has fought this great battle of the ages in his own human heart. As he has hung on his cross in the darkness, he has endured what no other human being in all of time has had to endure, the total forsakenness of God. He has endured total darkness of human spirit. He has endured the wrath of God against sin, for he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. There is nothing more than any lost person could endure in the second death that will come to the lost in the final judgment. Paul says that there is a sting of death, which is sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57. Now, 
that, uh, that sting has spent itself out in Christ. He has bared his soul to endure its sting, that is, its total condemnation. Glory of glories. The throne of God is now secure for all eternity to come. Aren't you happy? And by faith, you and I can share the victory. Now Christ has the right to trumpet his cry throughout the universe of God to all the unfallen worlds, to all the holy angels, to every nook and cranny of the world, to every demon in hell, and say, it is finished. Satan and sin are forever vanquished. Does your heart rejoice in this glorious victory? Do you say amen? Ah, oh, people, the victory is won in Christ. But I've got to say something. Still as of today, the battle in your heart and my heart remains to be finished in triumph over Satan and sin. We've got to decide where we're going to stand. We've got a choice to make. Are we going to be with the enemy or are we going to be in the sight of Christ? Now you and I can bring glory to Christ by demonstrating that his gospel is the power of God unto salvation here and now. Amen. And we are exhibit A. That's something worth living for. Amen. The power of God. God is going to give you his power. But it comes from the gospel. It comes from looking at Jesus, the Savior of the world. It comes from, like Paul says, from comprehending with all the saints, the height, the, dre the, the depth, the width, the breadth of the love of God. That love of God is poured into your heart. And it knows how to clean the heart. <laughs> you need an agape cleansing. Nothing cleanses the heart like agape of God. Oh, I got a little time to tell a story. Is it okay if I tell a story? <laughs> uh, evangelists have a few stories to tell. Um, I've got to tell you, it's almost a confession. When Colombia was in the throes of that terrorism and the um, drug cartels and all of that. Oh, uh, It wasn't exactly in my radar for evangelism. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't put it out of the radar, but I wasn't going to put it in there. You know what I mean? And um, even the general conference at the time said, don't, no, don't go, don't go. But Everything changes when God says go, right? Because the safest place in the world for you is to be where God wants you to be. And if you don't believe that, have a little conversation with uh, our friend Jonah <laughs> and see what he tells you. Yeah. The safest place is to be where God wants you to be. And so God said go to Colombia. And I went there, uh, not only worried about the situation, not so much that, but, uh, you know, uh, because of all uh, the rigmarole going on, I didn't have the opportunity to really prepare the, the field the way you normally do with small groups and do four or five visits before you finally go a year later, you know, all of that. And so I didn't know what I was going to find. But I got in my hotel room, and the first good news, I was going through the channels, boom, 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 boom. What? That's 3 a.m. In open channel. I said, this is good. <laughs> uh, the next thing, I go to a church Sabbath, and uh, there are people there. 
and they tell me, you know, we, uh, we've been praying for you. And the we, she said, are those of us, because that particular city had gone through terrible, terrible persecution. She said, those of us who lived through that time, and we remember the, the martyrs and the blood that was spilled in the street. And those of us who are remnant of those, we are praying for you that God will bless you. I said, wow, you know, this is special. And the third thing that encouraged me was, you know, the city, the authorities had told them again and again and again that they couldn't use these stadiums, you know, that uh, the government owned. So they built their own. Where the church and the school were, they built a 7,000-seat stadium. I said, these people mean business. <laughs> these are a people of faith. And there's no place better to be than with people of faith. And so I felt good. Well, i got to tell you the story. Because I've got not a lot of time. I'm standing there on the platform, and we made the call. Hundreds of people come forward, praise the Lord, hundreds and hundreds. And I hear a voice, like coming from under my feet, it seemed like, from underneath the earth, it seemed like. And the voice said, Pastor Frank, help me. I am a terrorist. I started looking for him. <laughs> what? I noticed what he said. He didn't say, I used to be a terrorist. I was a terrorist. He said what? I am a terrorist. Please help me. What do I do? And now there was a platoon of soldiers that, that were there. And they were assigned to us. And they would whisk me out to the back. And they would take me to my hotel each night with a different direction, different, you know, route. And um, they were beginning to pull me. And I was having the conversation with this man. And they were pulling me away. And so I, I had to scream. He said, what do I do? What do I do? I, I said, Jesus, Jesus, give your heart to Jesus. And I didn't see him again every night. You know, people must have thought, you know, Pastor Frank wants to look at every single one of us. But I was trying to find my young man. Is he there? And the nights went on. And the next to last night of the meetings, he did the same maneuver, you know, and came all the way and put himself in the same exact place as if to jar my memory. He didn't need any jarring. <laughs> And now he said, Pastor Frank, I'm going to get baptized. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And, and the next night, I saw him descend into the baptismal tank and be baptized. Wow. Jesus is so powerful. Amen. He can even save terrorists. Sometimes we think there's nothing you can do to these people except get rid of them. But God can save them because Jesus, praise His name, He is truly the Savior of the world. And yes, my friend, that means you, you who are watching. Whatever your background is, whatever your situation is. You know, a lot of these uh, terrorists in Latin America, they're picked up in their homes when they're children against the will, their will and the will of their parents. They are taken away and then they are raised as terrorists. That's what happens. I don't know what has happened in your life. Life has a way. Forces in life have a way of shaping our lives. But there's a biggest force bigger force. It is the force of the cross of Christ. It is the power that comes from Jesus dying for you and saying, it is finished. I saved you. Now come to me and I'll do the job. 
before we go to our next word, I want you to listen to this very, very special uh, music, musical selection that we will present for the glory of God and for the inspiration of all of us. Thank you so very much. Well, it's taken a little while, but we've come to the final <laughs> word. And you don't want to miss this final word. If you've just tuned in, we are looking at the words, the little sermons that Jesus preached while he was on his cross. And hang on. Because he said his words are spirit and are life. And there is nothing that has quite the spirit and the life as what he did and what he said while he was on his cross as the Savior of the world. That includes you. That includes me. And you know, it was on a Friday at noon, according to... Mark 15, verse 33.
The Bible calls it the sixth hour, that the sins of the whole world were laid upon Jesus, the Savior of the world. He felt they were his sins, you have to understand. Although they were not, he was totally sinless. But this burden crushed his soul. He felt as the lost will feel at last as they stand totally and finally condemned before the great white throne. Jesus was heartbroken, in despair. And as we saw in one of our previous studies, the fourth word from the cross, he was tasting death for every man, the real thing, what the Bible calls the second death. You know, at Avon Park, we uh, are kind of starting a movement. Uh, and it's interesting that now I'm here and I, and, and I have the ability to uh, present it to a lot of people. We want to start the Friday Noon for Jesus movement. <laughs> you know, we don't say thank you enough. And here's what we're doing. Friday at noon, whatever, whatever you are, whatever you're doing, you stop. And you say, thank you, Jesus. Because it was on a Friday at noon that you took my sins in a special way. And I want to thank you for that. And I've actually come up with a little formula. If you want to write it down, uh, it's JC G6 12. I want to make t shirts with that. <laughs> Not to sell or anything, but you know, as, a, as something that will spark conversation. JC G6 little dash. 12. What does it mean? What do you think JC is? Jesus Christ. G is for gratitude. Gratitude. Six is for Friday. Twelve is for 12 noon. JC dash G6 dash 12. I hope that, uh, uh, and, and if three of you and somebody here wants to make those t-shirts and get them out or whatever, uh, you don't have to uh, consult with me, please. I, 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 I'm, I presented this in church, and uh, uh, a sister in the church, Marilyn, she uh, presented me with a t-shirt that she had <laughs> made. Yeah. And so when you go out and people... You have that JC G612. They're going to say, What is that? I, excuse me, what does that mean? <laughs> and you have an opportunity to share the good news of the cross of Christ. Well, we've come to the seventh word from the cross. And now Jesus' heart finally, finally is at rest. He has progressed from that cry of forsakenness to a cry of total trust in his Father. He's gained the victory. He has seen no miracle performed. He has heard no voice from heaven to speak to him. No one has spoken a word of encouragement to him, not even his own disciples. But by faith, he has gained the victory. He has remembered what he learned in his study of the Bible. Now the end is here. He prays. Now he can say it. He didn't say it before. He said, my God, my God. Couldn't say Father. Now he says it. Father. Now he doesn't, he hasn't seen the Father the situation hasn't changed. He has changed. Amen. He believes the Father is there with him. He can't see him, can't sense him, but by faith he believes 
that the Father loves him. He understands he is the Savior of the world. And now that he has finished, the last word was, it is finished. Now he can say, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. This is in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. These were the last words Jesus spoke before his death, his seventh word from the cross. Now he's ready to die. His work is done. He dies triumphant. But we must note something very important here. These last words were not his own words. They were a direct quotation from the Bible. I'm trying to tell you people. He relied on the Bible. You mean Jesus. Yes, Jesus relied on Scripture, on what he had studied. It's the words of David's, David's 31st Psalm. These words were in his heart. In verse 5 of that psalm, it says, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. All that Jesus knew, the man Jesus, all that he knew of his father while on earth, he learned from the Bible. He truly became Emmanuel, God with us. He laid aside all of his divine prerogatives. He emptied himself to become one of us. He was a baby born in Bethlehem. He had no conscious memory of his preexistence. He did not sit in Mary's lap and regale her with stories of the wonderful place heaven is and of his former life adventures with the angelic hosts. No, he didn't do that. He was a true human baby. He had to learn to walk, to talk, he, everything, everything. Now, don't get it, don't get it wrong. He was also at the same time, the Son of God. But you could never know by looking at him. What was different about him was that he had absorbed by faith the Bible so much as his education that he became the Word made flesh. Amen. This is why in the last hour of his life, his mind was still saturated with what he had learned in the Bible when he was a youth. All that he had read was stored in his memory. And now in his hour of greatest need, there it was to comfort him, to encourage him. He had lived by the Word, and now he could die by the Word in perfect peace and happiness. He said, man should not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. Listen, people, when you feast upon this same bread of life, the word of God, those treasures of truth will also become part of your permanent memory. Amen. You know, I told you, one, one of my heroes is HMS Richards. The man knew his Bible. Uh, Del Delker, who would visit me often in my office. Am I making you jealous? <laughs> Wayne Hooper would come, would come around all the time. Bob Edwards, people like that, and HMS Richards Jr. But it was the quartet that would tell me the story. He says, you know, Frank, he says, we were in this camp meeting, and we were behind HMS. And, and he was 
reading his Bible <laughs> because he didn't make a show of his learning, you know. But he was reading his Bible. But we looked at there was something wrong about the Bible. We, and we looked closer. It was upside down, Frank. <laughs> it was upside down. The man wasn't reading his Bible. The Bible was in his mind. And it was in his heart. Now, I'm not saying you've got to memorize the whole Bible, dear. But, but you've got to treasure. Take a verse every morning. Treasure it. These truths of the Bible, treasure them. Learn them. It'll give you life and spirit. And Jesus promises in John 14, 26, you know the promise, that he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you, he says. Right? Right? The Holy Spirit is going to bring it back to you when you need it. Jesus needed it there, and he was there for him. In other words, when Satan tries to assail your mind, dear one, and, and your heart, tempting you to, to doubt that Jesus is your friend and your Savior, the Holy Spirit will flash into your mind those scriptures that you have read. And fortified by the Word of God, you will command Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Matthew 16, 23. We wonder why did Jesus quote that particular Psalm 31st in his last breath. When we turn to read it, we discover why. It describes his own experience. He saw himself in this Psalm. Look at verse 11. I am a reproach among all my enemies, but especially among my neighbors, and I'm repulsive to my acquaintances. Those who see me outside flee from me. Verse 12, I am forgotten like a dead man, out of mind. I am like a broken vessel. Verse 13, for I hear the slander of many, Fear is on every side. While they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take away my life. Verse 14. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. My times are in your hand. Verse 17. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord. Verse 22. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before your eyes. That's what he said at the beginning, remember? In the, 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 the fourth word. You've forsaken me, God. Why have you forsaken me? In my haste, I, I said, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried out to you. Oh, people, can you begin to see how real Jesus is? How close to us he has become? How he knows our experiences, our temptations, how his heart is touched with our weaknesses. Will the Father resurrect Jesus to new life? Now, in his last breath, Jesus resigns all into his Father's hand. Resurrect me or not, Jesus prays in effect, I commit my spirit, my life, my all, into your hands. The thought of reward was not in Jesus' mind. He was like Moses, who, you remember, prayed long ago that if God could not forgive Israel, blot me, I pray, out of your book, which you have written, Exodus 32, 32. He was a, he was a type of Christ. He was a, he was a typological thing that, that looked forward to, to what Christ went through. No, what was uppermost in Christ's mind as he drew his last breath was not a reward awaiting him, but he was thinking of the great reward that those who believe in him will inherit. In other words, whatever happens to me, take my life and give it to them. 
Whatever happens, Father, I'm in your hands. But take my life. Take my eternal life and give it to them. And if I perish, I perish. But, but save my precious. Remember, save my darling. Save those that I came to save. Oh, wow. Will you join me in giving thanks to Jesus and giving thanks to God? Oh. Oh, I don't have a lot of time. I wanted to tell you the story of my father in prison. I've got six and a half minutes. I'm going to have to be brief. You want to hear it? Amen. I told you my father was an agnostic. However, don't get it wrong. He admired people of faith. I mean, he had to. He married my mother. And um, he respected it. And he respected religious liberty. And uh, when he saw it taken away in our country, he was one of the reasons he started conspiring against the tyrannical regime that started being despotic and atheistic and imposing their atheism on people. Well, he ended up in prison. I told you how a first cousin of my mother went to arrest him with a platoon of soldiers. Years went by when he came out in 1979. Jesse Jackson went to Cuba. You might remember that. And um, the, gov the government doesn't always like for Jesse to do these things. But, but once he's, he's determined to do it, then they say, okay, if you're going to do it, if you have to go, here are the people that we want you to negotiate for. And my father was in that list because they know here what happens over there. And um, anyway, my father came out at that time. And it wasn't until 1992 that he told me this story. He couldn't talk about his imprisonment for all of that time. And one time I was in Pennsylvania working on a sermon Thursday night. He came down to the basement where I was and asked me what I was doing. I told him. He said, well, what is the sermon about? I said, prayer. And he said, prayer, huh? Mm. And I could tell he wanted to tell me something. My father, the agnostic, wanted to tell me something about prayer. Uh, and I said, well, you have something to tell me? He said, yes, I do. And I swiveled my chair. I, I said, you've got my full attention. And he told me what happened to him when they first arrested him. He said, Frank, I was arrested and tortured for 47 days. And, of course, he didn't know how many there would be and so forth. He said, I went through all those nights. And, and uh, I said, I said, but Dad, I said, how could you possibly endure 47 days of torture? Well, he said, well, I, I didn't know it was going to be that many. You know, you just want to survive the next day. And um, I said, well, why did you do it? What was your method? He said, well, I thought of all the people that would be arrested, all the men that would be arrested if I talked. And I thought of their children. And I had a child in my mind. Little Mary, little Mary, I went to the torture chamber thinking of little Mary. This is for me, little Mary. This is for little Mary. Oh, God, this is for little Mary, little Mary, little Mary. And uh, that's, she says, then it was little Joseph. And little was, you know, it was somebody. And, and that's, he said, that's how I did it. He said, but Frank, he said, I came to one night where I knew my body was so frail uh, I had taken so much. I said, I could not take any more. And I told God, if they come the next morning and take me to the torture chamber, 
I'm going to tell them everything, and it will be your fault. He said, but I didn't know if I was talking to somebody. He said, I didn't believe. I wasn't sure if he, believed, he existed or not. You know, that's what a, an agnostic is. An atheist knows there's no God, you know. But an agnostic, he doesn't know. He says, I didn't know if I was talking to the roof or what. But I said, if they come and get me, I'm going to spill all the beans. And the lives of those men will be in your hands. He wrestled with God. He said, the next morning, the same knock at the door, same two guys. I, and I started talking to him, you know, you know, whispering, talking to God. And the, the guard said, oh, you know, he's cuckoo. You know, that, that would happen there. He said, Frank, they grabbed me. We went down the hall. But instead of turning left on the hallway to take me to the torture chamber, they put me on a jeep, took me straight to prison, and never in 16 years, never touched me again. And, you know, he's kind of funny. He's got a sense of humor. And so he looked at me and said, put that in your sermon. <laughs> I said, you better believe it. <laughs> and you know what? My father is a believer in Christ. Oh, yes. You know, maybe you are going, dear one. You're listening. You're going through. It may not be that dramatic, but you're going through something. And you're wondering, is there really a God? And you know, the, the proof, you know the proof, what the proof is? What the historical proof is of God? What the historical proof is that God cares for you? It's Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's the proof. He was dying for you, that horrific death, so that he could be your Savior. Open your heart and welcome him in. And he will accept you. You are his precious. He died for you. Accept him today.